snow, ice, and tornado warnings that threaten millions across the country are now facing. A major winter storm is tracking from coast to coast with heavy snow hitting some tornado watches for others, even an extremely rare blizzard warning in effect in Los Angeles. Plus... I understand that I am suffering for a reason. The more I suffer, the less chances Russia has to win and the more chances we have for victory. Nearly one year to the day since Russia's invasion, our Ian panel is on the ground in Ukraine, bringing us stories of perseverance in the face of war. And... You're, you're helping these artists and they're trying. They're trying to break you. Be smart. Take a deep breath. Get through it. Yeah, he's better than me. <laughs> From the struggle to make art to creating works enjoyed by millions, our culture conversation with two of the most renowned dancers and choreographers in the world. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis coming to you from Los Angeles tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including World News Tonight anchor David Muir's exclusive interview with President Biden in Poland. Plus, just hours ago, the sentence handed down for rapper Nipsey Hussle's killer and how police cracked a 50-year-old cold case with the help of a single cigarette. Our correspondents are fanned out around the world covering that and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with the extreme weather across the country with 135 million Americans Americans in 36 states on alert for the threat from dangerous wind, snow, ice, and tornadoes. Some places in the West have already been hit hard, including blizzard conditions and dangerous driving on the highways in North Dakota. And heavy winds like those seen in the Bay Area are highlighting concerns about power outages as well as massive travel disruptions and delays. Here in Los Angeles, residents are facing an extremely rare blizzard warning for L.A. County, the first in more than two decades. Meanwhile, the Big Easy is seeing the hottest Marty Gras on record as heat sweeps across the South. ABC's Trevor Alt is tracking it all and leads us off. Tonight, coast to coast impacts from a massive winter storm that's just getting started. Blizzard conditions building in the upper Midwest, the region bracing for up to two feet of snow and 50 mile an hour wind gusts. Minnesota's governor declaring a peacetime emergency and activating the National Guard. Crews have been working all through the night and all day today trying to get salt and sand down on the roads. But even so, once we're in the thick of this storm, officials are already warning travel is going to be impossible. Newly released video from the Wyoming Highway Patrol showing the dangers first responders face. This close call with a semi caught on dash cam on I-80 near Rollins. In California, high winds Tuesday taking down huge trees in the Bay Area. This one blocking multiple lanes on the Bay Bridge. In Santa Cruz County, a one-year-old child rushed to the hospital in critical condition after a redwood tree crashed into a home. And in Los Angeles County, their first blizzard warning since 1989. We were talking about two to five feet of snow at 4,000 feet within about a one to two day period. Extreme snow totals raising the already high risk of avalanches in the west. Or Maria Villarreal outside Salt Lake City. Across the west, major highways are shut down so plows can clear the roadways and crews can do avalanche mitigation, including right here in Utah, where up to two feet of snow fell just overnight. The sprawling systems also snarling air travel. More than 1,500 flights canceled across the country today and hundreds more already canceled for tomorrow. And in Little Rock, Arkansas, the NTSB investigating if weather was a factor in a small plane crash today that killed all five people on board. There are reports that there were heavy winds and strong rains at that time. Trevor Alt joins us now from Minneapolis. Trevor, what measures are authorities there taking ahead of this storm? Well, Lindsay, in some parts of Minnesota already, the conditions are so bad that the Department of Transportation has started to shut down some sections of highways, and we anticipate through the night a lot more are going to be closing. The Department of Transportation says in whiteout conditions that they're expecting, even their plows are going to have a tough time driving. Lindsay. All right, Trevor Old for us. Thanks so much, Trevor. Let's get to ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's tracking this major storm. Hey, Rob. 
Hey, Lindsay, it's really stunning just how far reaching this storm is. Kind of a stalled Arctic front, a lot of pulses of energy coming along it. Uh, and the number of Americans it's impacting is really remarkable. Look at the advisories and the, the warnings that are posted continuously from coast to coast. There's you see the blizzard warning now up in L.A. County. The blizzard warning continues in Wyoming and, of course, uh, the upper plains. And now ice storm warnings and winter storm warnings pushing all the way uh, towards the northeast. And that's when the, where the snow is going to be uh, firing up here over the next uh, couple of hours. Storms fired up this morning and this afternoon across parts of uh, Missouri. 50, 60, 70 mile an hour winds in some spots. Trees down there. A dangerous icy mix just north of Chicago into Milwaukee, across Lake Michigan into Detroit. That will be ongoing through the overnight, and that icy mix rolls down I-90 during the early morning hours tomorrow across Albany into Boston for a messy commute there. That's when the blizzard really gets cranking back in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Two, hour, two inches per hour snowfall rates there, 50 mile an hour wind gusts, near impossible travel conditions, and of course that will mean power outages. I think we'll see another foot of snow on top of what they already got in, in places like like Wisconsin, northern parts of, uh, of Michigan, and also getting here into the, uh, into the northern uh, New York State and northern New England area. All right, there's a snow in the west. Mentioned that. you got to have colds for snow, right? We have 30 to 40 degrees below average temperatures in the west with that remarkable snowstorm and 30 to 40 degrees above average temperatures in the southeast tomorrow. Record highs possible in places like New Orleans. Orlando might hit 91, 83 in Raleigh, 80 degrees in, in Roanoke. That's around the time the next batch of snow and ice will arrive here in northern New York uh, late tomorrow. Remarkable system. Lindsay? Those temperatures just astronomical there. All right, Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Now to an ABC News exclusive interview with President Biden in Warsaw. The president spoke with World News Tonight anchor David Muir about Vladimir Putin, who has now declared Russia will suspend its commitment to the key nuclear treaty with the United States. President Biden calls it a big mistake as he stands by his support for Ukraine. I know this is a defining moment in this war. We watched your speech here in Warsaw, and as you know, just hours before, Vladimir Putin gave his own speech, and I wanted to ask you about something Vladimir Putin said. He said that Russia is suspending participation, cooperation, in the nuclear treaty with the United States. What's your message to Putin on that? It's a big mistake to do that, not very responsible, and, uh, but I don't read into that that he's thinking of using nuclear weapons or anything like that. I think it's a... Uh, I'm not sure what else he was able to say in his speech at the moment, but I think it's a mistake and uh, I'm confident we'll be able to work it out. He is saying he's going to suspend participation in this nuclear treaty. Rhetoric is one thing, but we're a year into this war now. Does it concern you when he says something like this and are we less safe? Well, look, I think we're less safe when we walk away from arms control agreements that are very much in both parties' interest and the world's interest. But I've not seen anything, we've not seen anything that where there's a change in his posture, what they're doing, the idea that somehow this means they're thinking of new, using nuclear weapons, international continental ballistic missiles. There's no evidence of that. You can catch the rest of David's interview with President Biden Friday night on World News Tonight. Today, U.S. officials revealed that Russia carried out an intercontinental ballistic missile test in the days before President Biden was in Ukraine this week. They say the test of the missile capable of delivering nuclear warhead appears to have failed. And while they added that the routine test did not pose a risk to the U.S., the timing does add to the echoes of the old Cold War alarm bell sounding louder tonight. ABC's senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce is in Warsaw for us. And Mary, Putin also took to the podium once again today. What did he have to say? This was quite the display, Lindsay. President Putin putting on this massive militaristic style rally, a big show of patriotism, really just to try and drum up support for his war. Putin argued that, that they are fighting to regain what he described as the historical boundaries of Russia, essentially making the argument that this war is a fight for Russia's very survival. Lindsay. And today Putin met with China's foreign minister. It's a meeting that we've been talking about all week. What can you tell us about that? 
Well, it was quite a sight to see the two of them sitting down together afterwards. Vladimir Putin describing relations between the two countries, saying that they are, quote, reaching new milestones and describing relations and cooperation between Russia and China as, quote, very important for stabilizing the international situation. This, of course, comes as the U.S. is growing increasingly concerned that Russia could reach out to Beijing for military help to fight the war in Ukraine. And one other thing, Vladimir Putin announcing today that the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, plans to visit Russia himself later this spring. Lindsay. Mary Bruce for us in Warsaw. Mary, thank you. Now to the news of a deadly raid in the occupied West Bank. Israeli forces video show them entering the city of Nablus, where they say that they were looking to arrest two militants suspected in previous shootings, but things escalated into an hours-long gunfight amid protests. At least 10 Palestinians were killed in the fighting and more than 100 injured. That's the highest number of Palestinians killed in fighting with Israeli defense forces in some 15 years and just the latest clash in recent weeks. ABC's James Longman recently reported for ABC News Live from the region where he talked with a spokesperson for a top leader of the new hard-right Israeli government about their approach to Palestinians. I mean, all I'm trying to do is work out how this new government is going to move the situation into a better place. Easy. We're going to be bad on the bad guys and good on the good guys. We're going to give we're going to give a harder time to the bad guys and give a more decent but opportunity here's, here's, for upward mobility but, for the good guys. But here's where I wonder that's the issue. Israel is seen to treat everyone like they're a bad guy, and so then you just create more that's bad not, guys. That's, that's, that maybe seems that way from London, but not from here. Our thanks to James for that. We'll continue tracking developments there. And if you uh, back in this country, in East Palestine, Ohio, workers have removed more than 4,500 cubic yards, the equivalent of one and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools of contaminated soil from the immediate area of the train derailment. And the governor's office reports that the EPA has conducted indoor air testing in 560 homes in the area. So far, no contaminants from the derailment have been detected. ABC's Alex Brashe is in Palestine tonight, where the disaster is turning political. Tonight, with anxious residents in East Palestine, Ohio, desperate for help after that toxic train derailment, that newly opened health clinic fully booked, with nearly 70 appointments scheduled through Thursday. And Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg now planning to visit the community tomorrow, after he and President Biden faced fierce backlash from Republicans and former President Donald Trump. Tonight, Trump on the ground here, nearly three weeks after that fiery derailment leaked hazardous chemicals, with this message. You are not forgotten. We stand with you, we pray for you, and we will stay with you in your fight to help answer and the accountability that you deserve. And with Trump in Ohio, the White House saying it's Trump himself that owes residents in East Palestine an apology. The White House saying in a statement, Congressional Republicans and former Trump administration officials owe East Palestine an apology for selling them out to rail industry lobbyists when they dismantled Obama-Biden rail safety protections, as well as EPA powers to rapidly contain spills. In 2017, Trump actually celebrated rolling back regulations that many advocates say might have protected communities. One of those withdrawn regulations calling for specialized systems on trains carrying hazardous materials. Trump tweeting, I am continuing to get rid of costly and unnecessary regulations. Much work left to do, but effect will be great. Tonight, it's not clear if any of those regulations specifically contributed to the accident in East Palestine. Alex Prashay joins us now. And Alex, how is Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg saying that these Trump rollbacks are affecting his response? Well, Lindsay, he's pointed to those rollbacks and laws pushed by congressional Republicans saying that they have constrained his team in some areas of rail regulation. Meanwhile, Lindsay, the NTSB is scheduled to release its preliminary report on this accident tomorrow. Lindsay? Alex Prashay for us. Thanks so much, Alex. And if you feel like you've been hearing about more train incidents in the wake of the East Palestine derailment, you may be on to something. We'll take a look at the trends by the numbers coming up later on in the show. And we turn now to Washington, where Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is accusing House Speaker Kevin McCarthy of the, quote, one of the worst security risks since 9-11, after McCarthy exclusively provided security uh, footage of the insurrection from within the Capitol to Fox News host Tucker Carlson. That development comes as ABC News has learned that Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner have been subpoenaed by Justice Department Special Counsel Jack Smith in relation to January 6th and the events leading up to that day. Meanwhile, a four-man, a four-woman in the Georgia Special Grand Jury is giving insights into that investigation of attempts to overturn the 2020 election. ABC's Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl has those details. 
And yet another sign the federal investigation into Donald Trump's action on and before January 6th is moving aggressively. Special counsel Jack Smith has subpoenaed the former president's daughter, Ivanka, and son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Earlier this month, the special counsel issued a subpoena for Vice President Pence. Sources tell ABC News the subpoenas for Kushner and Ivanka Trump are specifically related to the special counsel's investigation of January 6th and the efforts of the former president and his allies to overturn the 2020 election. This comes as the Fulton County, Georgia district attorney considers whether to seek an indictment against Donald Trump and his allies for tampering with Georgia's 2020 election results. And now, in the Georgia case, something highly unusual has happened. The forewoman of the 23-person special grand jury that investigated the case is talking publicly about the grand jury's work, revealing they recommended multiple indictments. It's not a short list. Not a short list. <laughs> she says she decided to speak because serving on the grand jury was, quote, a really cool experience. But she's giving her opinion of the case, even though most of the grand jury's work remains under seal. I will be sad if nothing happens. Like, that's, that's about my only request there is, is for something to happen. I don't necessarily know what it is. I'm not the legal expert. I'm not the judge. I'm not the lawyers. The case centers on Trump's efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss in Georgia, including his infamous call asking the state's Republican Secretary of State to, quote, find exactly the number of additional votes he needed to win. I just want to find uh, 11,000... 780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Those words continue to come back to haunt him. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. John, what's expected to happen next on potential indictments in the Georgia case, and how could that juror's comments have any impact? Well, the decision on whether or not to indict is entirely in the hands of the Fulton County District Attorney, but some legal experts say that this grand juror's uh, talking about things publicly could complicate things. When the special grand jury was disbanded uh, about a month ago, the judge did not forbid them from speaking publicly, but under Georgia law, uh, Lindsay, they are not permitted uh, to speak about their deliberations. Jonathan Carl for us. Thanks so much, John. The Orange County, Florida Sheriff's Office is set to brief the media following a shooting this evening that reportedly involved a local news team. The shooting occurred at the same scene of a deadly shooting earlier in the day where local reporters were on site covering the discovery of a woman shot to death in the Pine Hills neighborhood of Orlando. Police say a suspect has been detained. The condition of the news crew is unknown. We will, of course, bring you more updates as soon as we get them. Turning now to Colorado, the state court began to hear proceedings in the trial of the suspect behind the Club Q shooting. The shooter allegedly opened fire at the LGBTQ plus bar last November, killing five people and injuring at least 19. The suspect faces 323 charges, which include first degree murder, attempted murder and bias motivated crimes. According to Colorado State's public defender, the suspect identifies as non-binary. Back here in Los Angeles, the man convicted of killing rapper Nipsey Hussle has been sentenced to at least 60 years in prison with the potential to get a life sentence. Eric Holder Jr. was found guilty of first degree murder in the fatal shooting of the rapper last summer and convicted of two counts of attempted voluntary manslaughter, including possession of a firearm. Holder pleaded not guilty. His attorney plans to appeal his sentence. Nipsey Hussle was known as Neighborhood Nip in Crenshaw. He died in front of his business marathon clothing store. Holder, an aspiring rapper, belonged to the same gang as, as Hussle, but in his final years, he had worked to stop violence and broker peace between rival gangs in his community. He was 30 years old. The state of Mississippi is raising eyebrows for some and creating full-blown outrage for others after the Republican-led state house passed a bill that would form a court system of unelected judges and prosecutors to preside over part of the capital city of Jackson and expand the Capitol Police Force. In short, instead of giving the city's majority black residents an opportunity to exercise their voting rights to elect judges and prosecutors, the power would fall to government officials. Joining us now is one of the biggest opponents of this legislation, Mississippi House Minority Leader Representative of Robert L. Johnson III. Representative, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. 
So I want to start by reading uh, part of your joint statement about these bills. You say HB 1020 and SB 2889 are an insult and a distraction, taking power away from the citizens of our capital city while we waste critical hours sitting around and letting hospitals close and our people die. You go on to say these bills are what modern day Jim Crow looks like. Explain to us how this bill even got this far along in the process to begin with. Well, we have a majority, a supermajority led House and Senate and a Republican governor. And uh, as I describe them from time to time, they are kind of new to this process and they don't have any respect for the rules, procedure or the tr tradition of the legislature. And so we don't even there, there are there are there are even opportunities to debate some of these issues. They've just decided that they're just going to run a uh, uh, rap shot over the whole process and have what they want. All right, so just break it down for us in layman terms. If this were to pass, what would this mean for the black residents? Well, they, they would essentially have uh, judges who would be appointed by a Supreme Court justice who was appointed by this very governor that, that is engineering this, this effort. Uh, they wouldn't have any say-so in that, in that, uh, in that judgeship, those, those multiple judgeships. And so those people would answer to no one uh, who lives in Hines County. Not only would that judge not be elected, that judge could come from anywhere in the state. And so that the Constitution says all of our judges should be elected, uh, must be, shall be elected. And so this takes that, that, that right to vote, that right to exercise their constitutional power from the people in the city of Jackson. So all the cases, I mean, it would be the most important part of this. So all the cases that anybody brings against the state of Mississippi, and we, we bring them all the time. I'm a lawyer. We, if you sue the state of Mississippi, they have to come through the circuit or chancery court in Hines County. There was a, a time when we were fighting for more money for public education. And one of the things that, that they wanted to challenge was the constitutionality of the referendum proposal. One of the white Republican legislators told his constituents, if we pass this referendum, then you'll have to answer to a, a black judge in Hines County. That you know, it, uh, there are these 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 little phrases, these invites that they have that always point to race. Is there a chance that this bill will die in the Senate? There is a chance the bill will die in the Senate. Uh, thankfully, because of the uproar, because of the 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 push that that many of us have had from from lawyers to community activists to legislators, I think, and and, and the national prep pressure from people like just the exposure from networks from people like you uh they, they are feeling the pressure uh this looks uh does look like jim crow like post reconstruction this looks, looks like everything that uh some of us who are old enough uh remember growing up through the civil rights movement the things that we fought to to reverse representative curious I know your intention is to stop it, but but let's just play devil's advocate here. Are you concerned yeah. that if this bill does become law, would it create a new template for a Republican fight for the years to come, similar to, to what's happened with critical race theory law, for example? Well, yes. It, it, look, we tell people, we, we've been telling people all over the state, this is not a Jackson problem. This is a Mississippi problem. If they're going to do it to Jackson, they'll do it to Greenville, Greenwood, anywhere they want to go. They want to create a city within a city that just serves a, a particular segment of the population. Uh, this capital city complex uh, uh, has a, a disproportionate white population, doesn't represent the, the actual per capita uh, uh, demographic in the city of Jackson. And that's this is a template for what they'll do in any city that that has black or African American leadership. And so, yes, it, the danger is that this is the this is the route Republicans will continue to do where, in places where they lose political power. Mississippi Democratic Minority Leader Representative Robert Johnson III. Hey, we thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you for having me. Still much more ahead to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, the new developments in the investigation into the case of a teacher allegedly shot by a six-year-old who's now looking at the final report. But next, devastation, death, and suffering have been seen across Ukraine after Russia invaded. Nearly a year later, our Ian panel reconnects with people that we met at the start of the conflict who say they may be struggling, but they want to keep on fighting. Did you ever, ever imagine this would become normal? Does it feel normal? 
I understand that I am suffering for a reason. The more I suffer, the less chances Russia has to win and the more chances we have for victory. But... America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Bit a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This time last year, many doubted U.S. intelligence warnings that Russia planned to invade Ukraine. Nearly one year later, tens of thousands of Ukrainian lives have been lost and communities across the country have been destroyed, leaving too many families devastated or divided. Yet Ukraine still stands and its citizens vow to fight on. Our Ian Panel has been on the ground from the very beginning and recently caught up with some of the people he first met one year ago to reflect on this conflict. Here's a sneak peek of his remarkable new reporting featured in the new ABC News Live special, standing strong, one year of war in Ukraine. On a crisp winter's morning, Yegor, Marishka and their three kids make Sunday brunch, a regular Ukrainian family together. But with 100,000 Russian troops amassing at the border, news anchor Marishka Podolko has something other than waffles on her mind. If something really happens in Kyiv, because we've been covering war in the eastern Ukraine, but if something happens in Kyiv, what do I do first? Do I go to the TV station to report about this, or do I go home to see my kids and take care of my kids? Because I know that my husband will have 24 hours to show up to his commander and do what he has to do and not to be taking care of the family. I have to be a strong for everyone because I know that my kids are looking up at me. One year later, Marichka lives a life of many parts. Her daughters are refugees abroad. Her husband's fighting on the front line. And she lives at home with her son in Kyiv, often without power. We have charged power banks. We have headlights. We have candles. Did you ever, ever imagine this would become normal? Does it feel normal? I understand that I am suffering for a reason. The more I suffer, the less chances Russia has to win and the more chances we have for victory. The whole idea of targeting our critical infrastructure was not just to cut off the electricity, but cut off our spirits. And it will not happen. When Marichka isn't at home, she's at the new studio where generators keep the lights on. I've been announcing so many difficult stories from different parts of the globe, but I never was in the situation to be a part of this story. My husband was the one who believed that the invasion was going to happen, and he was worried about the real invasion. 
45-year-old Yegor Zaboliev is a former lawmaker. One year ago, he was working in IT and a civilian volunteer with the Territorial Defense. Today, he's a battle-hardened soldier fighting on the front line. Yegor. You look better and better. <laughs> this really was the front line. Yes. The Russians never came further than no, this? No, this is... Uh, this is where last you... place of Russian occupation from oh, this okay. part of Ukraine. Right. And free Ukraine started here. <laughs> wow. Putin unleashed a massive attack. Tanks rolling across the borders, fighter jets and attack helicopters in the skies, and endless waves of troops. A steadfast President Zelensky summoned his countrymen to defend their land, and ordinary people like Yegor heeded the call of duty. It was the only way for Ukraine to survive. There were injuries on this side? Yeah, here. Yeah. Right. And one guy is dead right. on another front line, but right. he is dead. Today, over 107,000 Ukrainians are dead. Towns and villages are under occupation. Widespread allegations of war crimes in places like Izum, Mariupol and Bucha. <laughs> and countless innocent civilians scarred forever by the atrocities they've seen. After the liberation, after their retreat, a lot of people uh, started to come from Bucha, because this is Bucha. They were so scared, they were so terrorized. They must have been so traumatized, those poor people. No one expected Ukraine to be able to stand its ground, not least Vladimir Putin. While Russia rapidly seized new territories, it struggled to hold on to many of them, losing the key cities of Kharkiv, Kherson, and Irpin. It's a place of the most important victory in Ukrainian history. We saved independence. For the first time, we defended our capital and saved uh, the independence for the whole country. I am extremely proud. I think this is the most important job in my life. If we speak honestly, it has been a year of great sacrifice and of loss for Ukraine. And also, I'm struck by, for you as a family on one level, because I, I saw this very tight unit, a very close family, enjoying their weekends together, making waffles, sitting at lunch. And now your family's scattered and you have to go off to war all the time. I, I guess you can't allow yourself to think about that, but, but the personal sacrifice actually is very real. Yeah, but uh, I'm happy uh, every day because my girls are safe and it inspires me. Uh, it makes me stronger on the front line. Uh, I think this is uh, the best uh, place uh, for them to be now. It would be better uh, to live in previous uh, life, uh, but it is impossible. Yegel's only seen his family four times since the start of the war. The hope is that the day will come that when he goes home, he won't have to leave again. So touching to see that. Be sure to check out Ian's remarkable new special, Standing Strong, One Year of War in Ukraine. It debuts tomorrow at 8.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, right after Prime. Still much more to get to tonight. The investigation into a baffling object discovered on a beach, the growing mystery surrounding this sphere. But next, the train derailment in Ohio is not an isolated case. We take a look at more past derailments by the numbers. 
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's like any other day. Our friends invited us to come see one of their kids playing this little league baseball game. And that was the last time I saw her. Anyone who abducts a child, you're probably twisted beyond untwisting. We have 8,300 leads in her case. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. People don't understand how you can keep fighting, but Morgan is worth fighting for. Morgan! From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Kelsey Turner was a rising Insta model. Kelsey definitely wanted to be famous. She would do anything to get what she was due. A beloved child psychiatrist missing. An Instagram model missing. There was a body in the trunk, clean cut guy. He don't normally end up beat to death in trunks or cars. Sometimes we have to realize there's evil in this world. Now, Friday night. You're witness to a murder. So what happened next? <laughs> All new 2020, Friday night on ABC. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. In the wake of the disastrous chemical train derailment in Palestine, Ohio, we've all had a watchful eye on the rail networks, and we're noticing what seems like a lot of incidents, so we decided to look into it. Here's what we found by the numbers. There were 818 derailments in 2022, and this year we've already seen more than a dozen train incidents. But when it comes specifically to hazardous materials, 447 cars carrying dangerous goods were either damaged or derailed last year in Alabama, California, Florida, Illinois, Illinois, Indiana, Louisiana, Texas, and of course, Ohio. There have been some 80 incidents where roadways and rails meet. That's up 10% from a decade ago. And after two decades of declining deaths, we are now seeing a dramatic rise, up more than 30% since 2012. 97% of the deadly incidents involve illegal trespassing. The U.S. freight rail system comprises about 140,000 miles of track and is widely considered one of the world's largest, according to the Federal Railroad Administration. For comparison, China has about half of that mileage. And there is no way for residents to see if they live near an area where hazardous materials are transported. We're told that kind of database would make it too easy for terrorists or other criminals to target trains carrying potentially dangerous cargo. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. How investigators solved a more than 50-year-old cold case murder using a cigarette. Dance has long been an expression of art for centuries and a major part of black culture. Choreography icons Lori Ann Gibson and Sean Bankhead talk about sharing the gift of movement and their own contributions to pop culture. Boom cat. Where did that come from? Rookie Lulu. Oh, wow. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, Where did this come from? 
so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. It's like any other day. Our friends invited us to come see one of their kids playing this little league baseball game. And that was the last time I saw her. Anyone who abducts a child, you're probably twisted beyond untwisting. We have 8,300 leads in her case. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. People don't understand how you can keep fighting, but Morgan is worth fighting for. Morgan! Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charged in a sweeping 56 count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not going to let that happen on our watch. Not with hip hop music, using our lyrics. We're going to fight back. Rap, trap, hip hop on trial. Only on Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is one of the most powerful projects I've ever been involved with. My son died in a shootout. I'm calling the cops on the cops. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. The latest in the investigation into the shooting of a teacher, the surprising object that solved a more than 50-year-old cold case and the mysterious object discovered on a beach. Those stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. And I wish it didn't have to be this way. Um, and I wish we never had to investigate this case. But here we are. Police in Newport News, Virginia, say they have finished their investigation into the shooting of a first grade teacher by a six year old student last month. The police chief said the department has handed its findings to the city's prosecutor. For the most part, I think we interviewed every student that was there. And that's hard. Police in Burlington, Vermont, say they've cracked a cold case after more than 50 years with the help of a cigarette. In 1971, 24-year-old Rita Coran was found by her roommate strangled to death in her room. Police say they've now identified this man, William DeRoos, who lived in her apartment building as her killer. Police say it all came down to identifying the DNA found on a cigarette butt and on the victim's clothing. At the time, police questioned DeRoos and his wife, but they insisted they did not see or hear anything. William DeRoos told the police officers that they were home. They didn't hear anything and didn't see anything. And immediately upon closing the door, he turned to Michelle and asked her and told her that if the police ever showed up again, she was to tell him that he was home all night because he had a criminal history. And if they knew he was out, they would come after him for this. But there will be no potential for prison time here. Police say the alleged killer died of a drug overdose in San Francisco in 1986. I don't think so much about the guy who did this as I do about Rita and my parents, what they went through. 
An emotional return for the Michigan State University men's basketball team. The Spartans beating Indiana in their first home game since the deadly campus shooting more than a week ago. Eight seats reserved for the victims, three who died, and the five wounded. Coaches and fans in the stands wearing white Spartan strong t-shirts. Longtime head coach Tom Izzo in tears saying he was happy for our team happier for our students and hoping they took away some of the pain for a couple of hours. What does this look like to you? An egg belonging to Godzilla? Perhaps a giant potato from space? That's the mystery Japanese authorities are now grappling with, even sending a bomb squad to investigate. A local discovered the mysterious orb on the beach about three hours south of Tokyo. One local told Japanese broadcaster NHK he was surprised to see authorities using x-rays to determine if it was safe. Apparently, it had been there a while, and he even tried to push the immovable object. So far, the theory is that it's nothing more than some type of buoy. A cat who was formerly owned by a cartel leader in Mexico is now up for adoption. The Sphinx, seized after a raid, went viral for its Los Mesiclas prison gang tattoo. Juarez city officials mentioned that they received over 100 texts and phone calls before making the adoption announcement. And it's not limited to Juarez residents. It's also open to people from other cities in Mexico and even from the U.S. The city will be accepting applications from now through February 28th. The unnamed cat is supposedly very friendly with people, but not with other cats. Do you take your coffee with cream, sugar, or olive oil? That's the question Starbucks is asking as it unveils a new line of cold coffee beverages infused with a spoonful of cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil. Starbucks is calling the line Oleatu, heralding it as a transformational innovation, saying it will make the coffee smoother. But if you want to feel well lubricated, for now it'll only be available in Italy starting next week. All right, five, six, seven, eight, or in this case, boom cack. Dance has had an impact on culture all around the world. Two people that know it inside and out are creative directors and choreographers, Lorianne Gibson and Sean Bankhead. Our Ike Jachi met the two inside the dance studio to talk about the gift that they both love to foster, the gift of movement. Here's the third installment of the ABC News Live and GMA3 series, Culture Conversations. My dancing style is like me. It is an influence of the greatness of the, the 90s, the early 90s, mm, early 2000s, mm, mm. the care, the pocket, the groove, the That's soul, mm. the music. They used to call me 60-40, the club. Okay. They wouldn't give me 100% street. <laughs> Because I would jump in that circle and give you street, honey, but then I would give you give five to seven pirouettes exactly. on a dime and extend that leg. I gotta ask you. Boom cat. <laughs> Where did that come from? Bookie loop loop. Oh, <laughs> What's going oh on? My God. Where did this come from? It's dancer talk. Yeah. It's it's how we I don't think we're counters. How does it sound? What was it? Uh, uh, boogie boogie boots. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Crack. Because uh, you do all uh, that. Do you know something going right now? What do you do? Exactly. Years ago, because I don't do the in betweens unless I do. I say a bunch of other stuff. When did you first realize that dance was inside of you? That's a great question. Yeah. The way you word it, because. It was not outside of me. It was inside of me. And my mother had put my other sisters in dance. I am the baby of three girls. And they both rejected it. So apparently I asked to dance. And then I just was a savage. I just took off from there. So I definitely know I was born to dance. And it was a gift. Same. It was a natural thing, thing inside yeah. me. You are and gifted. Later on, got to figure out. Let me cultivate this. Let me let me train. Let me practice. Um, yeah. Whenever you have something that you know you have, whether it be dance, music, whatever, uh, and you have to fight to be able to show people. You know, it's not something that's just handed to you on the silver That's platter. right. I feel like it kind of makes it more special. It Absolutely. makes your contributions that much more important. We're survivors. Yeah. <laughs> we thrive. I think that's one thing that people don't understand that when you're behind the scenes and you're working with these artists and working with labels and working with managements and, and that's right. all of these people that you have to really be strong-minded to um, get to the part where you can actually 
show your talent. Produce you know, the art. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I didn't realize the fight was something that was curating greatness mm -hmm. early. I didn't know. I had blinders on, like Sean says, in order to survive. I saw Alvin Ailey at 12 years old. I grew up in Toronto, so I was studying at the National Ballet of Canada, and I was the only black girl in the school, so I, I, I didn't really understand till I saw Alvin Ailey. My attraction to Ailey was about him as a storyteller, mm -hmm. right. Alvin Ailey. Yeah. Then I was also obsessed with Debbie Allen, Lola Falana, Diana Ross. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mix that all together and yeah. you get boom back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about that fight and how it kind of molded you into greatness, into where you are now. It was compounded more than probably the peers that you were even trying to go up against. Because I was female and because I was black, right. I wasn't supposed to produce 65 million selling white girl named Lady Gaga. I wasn't supposed to successfully do Make a Man. I wasn't supposed to put the Jonas Brothers together. I wasn't supposed to work with the Dixie Chicks. I wasn't supposed to tap into multi-genre, multi-faceted mm. lanes, and I wasn't and supposed... And be successful. Yes, <laughs> and outdo the white version of it. Mm. And to piggyback off that, yeah. then you are... You're intimidating to them. So then you yeah. have to fight even more. Now, as a black gay man, right, mm -hmm. I feel like you get it a little bit easier than the black gay, the black. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> than the black female. What I've realized moving into the business space right. is that there is a lack of respect of kind of my manhood when it comes to handling mm. business. Five, six, seven, eight. I've had times where I've had to be like, Sean, don't let them break you. Don't, because you have a job to do, your name is on the line, you, you're, you're helping these artists, and they're trying. They're trying to break you. Be smart. Take a deep breath. Get through it. Yeah, he's better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the generational shift. You get it! I thought it was about telling the truth. Whoa! You had to hmm. fight. You had to. But I wanted to say this to you. Outside of the effect that you've had with artists and, your, and choreography and dance, you have been able to transition yourself into a pop culture icon. Seriously. You walk into the room and people know you sometimes more than they know the artist. You know what I mean? YouTube, TikTok, is this changing the industry? Do you Absol think? Absolutely. And for the better or for the worse? I'm gonna say this. TikTok is a 30 second dance from the chest up and these TikTok dancers then get into rehearsal and they can't even do an eight hour, let alone a one hour rehearsal. When you're working now, mm -hmm. does it just produces a dancer that you can't really work with? Like, what's the frustration for you there? I think there's a lack of expertise and knowledge. Okay. You know what I mean? And, and does it affect your process ultimately? Absolutely, okay. because instead of getting, you, 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 you get a room of, I don't have to yell. I don't have to be like, feel the fire, feel yeah, the magic. Okay. You know what I mean? You got to actually teach them to we dance. Still, we, I'm still teaching people how to dance. I'm still teaching As people how to... As a professional, you should already know that. I'm still teaching people how to care. It's a job now instead of a passion. Oh, that's tough. It's like, oh, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. And why are you not being a star on stage? Learn that from, you know... You have to be a star on stage. And then there's a lot of artists that, you know, they kind of want to mute the dancers. I don't like working on those jobs. I know you don't either. Let the dancers be stars. And they don't even know how to do that. Let them dance. Let them dance. Let them dance. Our thanks to Ike Jachi for that great conversation. Be sure to join our half-hour special Culture Conversations featuring many more chats like this one, which airs Friday, February 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Two-time Grammy nominee DeBrat has revealed she is expecting her first baby at 48 years old. The rapper and her wife talked about the pregnancy with ABC's Janae Norman. Take a look. They're the lyrics she rapped two decades ago in her hit song, In Love With You. And this morning, these words hitting particularly close to home for DeBrat and her wife, Judy. 
the evolution of you as an individual. Could you even imagine what you would tell yourself? I was hanging with JD and Criss Cross and Method Man and Biggie and Pac, you know, we were just having a great time. I never thought, <laughs> never thought that I would be settled down, married, and pregnant. <laughs> like, I just never thought that. The couple revealing Tuesday, DeBrat is pregnant at 48 with their first child together, a journey they say began soon after they tied the knot last February. I never really wanted to have kids until I met her, like until I came out of the closet and started living my life out loud and able to like share with the world who I love and, you know, what I love doing with the person I love. And that made me want to just experience everything that you can get out of life. I want a little us. I think that would be like amazing. <laughs> Today is the day, beautiful. DeBrat and Judy documenting the emotional ups and downs on the latest season of their reality show, Brat Loves Judy. So then we had to see a cardiologist, I had to see a hematologist. I had fibroids and then, thank God they weren't close to my uterus, but then I found out I had two polyps, so I had to get those removed. And then uh, it was just thing after thing. So we went back, uh, they got it in, and it was successful. We had to wait 10 days mm -hmm. to see if we were pregnant. We took the blood test and stuff, and it was positive. We were pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then a few days later, the numbers went down, and we miscarried. But after the heartache, came hope. I thought she wasn't going to want to go again. Really? Yeah. Because, you know, she had never experienced pregnancy. She and was we really so excited. Happy. But on the other side of that... On the other side of that, we did a second embryo transfer. About two to three days after, she kind of, she was like, let's just go back. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 18 weeks along, DeBrat and Judy are set to welcome their baby in July. And they say they hope their story inspires other women to take a chance at motherhood later in life. What is your message? to anyone out there who feels like it's too late for them. Whatever your dream is or whatever you would like to do in life, you only live once. Or if you really want a child, you can carry a child. You don't have to give up. Our thanks to Janae for that. As our ABC family celebrates the 10th anniversary of Robin Roberts' return to GMA after a life-saving bone marrow transplant, we bring you the story of a 12-year-old bone marrow recipient from Louisiana meeting his donor for the very first time. Take a look. I was eight years old when I got diagnosed with cancer. I knew a little bit about cancer, like how you lose your hair and stuff, but other than that, I just knew it was a sickness. That January, right after the Christmas break, he had just got back into school. He even started playing sports again. We did his blood work, and then the doctor called again. I just remember being so angry. How am I gonna tell him that he's got cancer again? He has cancer of the blood, and it's got a certain set of instructions. Camden's instructions said, when you make blood, put cancer in it. So we had to get instructions from someone else. That's sort of when, I, I guess, they dipped into the donor pool. They found 50 people that were a match. Well, 50 matches is great, but who's going to answer the call? I'm Ben Denny. I'm a firefighter in Odessa, Texas. When I signed up for Be The Match, I knew nothing about donating bone marrow. They started calling me at like, the beginning of 2021, and they said I was a match. And all they could really tell me was there's a 10-year-old boy with leukemia. I mean, I probably would have done it for anybody, but 10-year-old boy, like, yeah, I'm gonna do whatever I can to help him. It's my day! Woo! You have to wait a year after you get the donation to even reach out to see if you can find the donor. So we waited our year, we filled out our form, and we turned it in, and then nothing. And then one night, ding. I think. I think I'm your son's donor. He doesn't realize how big it is, because it's just a blessing to have him here with us all because of him. Luckily, it reminded me that this world is not all ugly, right? There are still good people in this world and people who will do a random act of kindness. I mean, hope and humanity restored, right? And I just thought, I mean, this guy's amazing. He's a 10 out of 10. Nah, I don't feel like a hero. I feel like Anybody else would have done it. What makes America so great is we're willing to help our neighbors, even if we don't know them, so. I don't think I'm a hero. Cam's little, like, saying through the whole process was choose joy. If Cam can choose joy through that, 
I have to choose joy every day with the little things that go on my life that get me down. Like, there's no option with that. <laughs> Hope in humanity restored. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Hour, ditching the online application sites and resumes, the new frontier for people searching for their next career move. And a surprising discovery, what astronomers found when they used a powerful telescope to see the early days of the universe. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. It's like any other day. Our friends invited us to come see one of their kids playing this little league baseball game. And that was the last time I saw her. Anyone who abducts a child, you're probably twisted beyond untwisting. We have 8,300 leads in her case. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. People don't understand how you can keep fighting, but Morgan is worth fighting for. Morgan! This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, Exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from New York, I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A plane carrying workplace environment experts to provide support for the Ohio plant explosion earlier this week crashed soon after takeoff in Little Rock, Arkansas today. All five people on board were killed. The airport was experiencing severe weather around the time of the crash. Police and school officials in Newport News, Virginia, are investigating a student for a gun-related incident for the second time this week. This is the same school district where a six-year-old shot his teacher last month. In the latest incidents, police discovered a gun in a high school student's belongings after receiving a tip. And a fifth grader texted that they would, quote, pop some bullets and tell someone to shoot up the class. The school district is increasing security at all of its schools. And astronomers have used the James Webb Space Telescope to peer into the early days of the universe, and they found a huge surprise. Those red and blue dots are from galaxies that existed more than 500 million years ago, and six of them appear to weigh billions of times more than our sun nearly as big as the Milky Way. A report released today in the journal Nature says the massive discovery is completely upending existing theories about the origins of galaxies. Now to the extreme weather across the country with 135 million Americans in 36 states on alert for the threat from dangerous wind, snow, ice and tornadoes. It's already causing power outages and travel disruptions as the storm systems move east. And here in Los Angeles, residents are facing an extremely rare blizzard warning for L.A. County, the first in more than two decades. ABC's Trevor Alt is tracking it all. Tonight, coast to coast impacts from a massive winter storm that's just getting started. Blizzard conditions building in the upper Midwest, the region bracing for up to two feet of snow and 50 mile an hour wind gusts. Minnesota's governor declaring a peacetime emergency and activating the National Guard. Crews have been working all through the night and all day today trying to get salt and sand down on the roads. But even so, once we're in the thick of this storm, officials are already warning travel is going to be impossible.
Newly released video from the Wyoming Highway Patrol showing the dangers first responders face. This close call with a semi caught on dash cam on I-80 near Rollins. In California, high winds Tuesday taking down huge trees in the Bay Area. This one blocking multiple lanes on the Bay Bridge. In Santa Cruz County, a one-year-old child rushed to the hospital in critical condition after a redwood tree crashed into a home. And in Los Angeles County, their first blizzard warning since 1989. We we're talking about two to five feet of snow at 4,000 feet within about a one to two day period. Extreme snow totals raising the already high risk of avalanches in the west. On Maria Villarreal outside Salt Lake City. Across the west, major highways are shut down so plows can clear the roadways and crews can do avalanche mitigation, including right here in Utah, where up to two feet of snow fell just overnight. The sprawling systems also snarling air travel. More than 1,500 flights canceled across the country today and hundreds more already canceled for tomorrow. And in Little Rock, Arkansas, the NTSB investigating if weather was a factor in a small plane crash today that killed all five people on board. There are reports that there were heavy winds and strong rains at that time. Trevor Alt joins us now from Minneapolis. Trevor, what measures are authorities there taking ahead of this storm? Well, Lindsay, in some parts of Minnesota already, the conditions are so bad that the Department of Transportation has started to shut down some sections of highways, and we anticipate through the night a lot more are going to be closing. The Department of Transportation says in whiteout conditions that they're expecting, even their plows are going to have a tough time driving. Lindsay. All right, Trevor Alt for us. Thanks so much, Trevor. Let's get to ABC's senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano, who's tracking this major storm. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay, it's really stunning just how far reaching this storm is. Kind of a stalled Arctic front, a lot of pulses of energy coming along it. Uh, and the number of Americans it's impacting is really remarkable. Look at the advisories and the, the warnings that are posted continuously from coast to coast. There's you see the blizzard warning now up in LA County. The blizzard warning continues in Wyoming and of course uh, the upper plains and now ice storm warnings and winter storm warnings pushing all the way uh, towards the northeast. And that's when this, where the snow is going to be uh, firing up here over the next uh, couple of hours. Storms fired up this morning and this afternoon across parts of uh, Missouri. 50, 60, 70 mile an hour winds in some spots. Trees down there. A dangerous icy mix just north of Chicago into Milwaukee, across Lake Michigan into Detroit. That will be ongoing through the overnight and that icy mix rolls down I-90 during the early morning hours tomorrow across Albany into Boston for a messy commute there. That's when the blizzard really gets cranking back in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Two hour, two inches per hour snowfall rates there, 50 mile an hour wind gusts, near impossible travel conditions. And of course that will mean power outages. I think we'll see another foot of snow on top of what they already got in, in places like uh, Wisconsin, northern parts of, uh, of Michigan, and also getting here into the, uh, into the northern uh, New York State and northern New England area. All right, there's a snow in the west. Mentioned that. you got to have colds for snow, right? We have 30 to 40 degree below average temperatures in the west with that remarkable snowstorm and 30 to 40 degrees above average temperatures in the southeast tomorrow. Record highs possible in places like New Orleans. Orlando might hit 91, 83 in Raleigh, 80 degrees in, in Roanoke. That's around the time the next batch of snow and ice will arrive here in northern New York uh, late tomorrow. Remarkable system. Lindsay? Those temperatures just astronomical there. All right, Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Now to an ABC News exclusive interview with President Biden in Warsaw, Poland. The president spoke with World News Tonight anchor David Muir about Vladimir Putin, who has just declared Russia will suspend its commitment to the key nuclear treaty with the United States. President Biden calls it a big mistake as he stands by his support for Ukraine. I know this is a defining moment in this war. We watched your speech here in Warsaw. And as you know, just hours before, Vladimir Putin gave his own speech. And I wanted to ask you about something Vladimir Putin said. He said that Russia is suspending participation, cooperation in the nuclear treaty with the United States. What's your message to Putin on that? It's a big mistake to do that. Not very responsible. And, uh, but I don't read into that that he's thinking of using nuclear weapons or anything like that. I think it's a... Uh, I'm not sure what else he was able to say in his speech at the moment, but I think it's a mistake and uh, I'm confident we'll be able to work it out. He is saying he's going to suspend participation in this nuclear treaty. Rhetoric is one thing, but we're a year into this war now. Does it concern you when he says something like this and are we less safe? Well, look, 
I think we're less safe when we walk away from arms control agreements that are very much in both parties' interest and the world's interest. But I've not seen anything, we've not seen anything that where there's a change in its posture and what they're doing. The idea that somehow this means they're thinking of new, using nuclear weapons, international continental ballistic missiles, there's no evidence of that. Our thanks to David for that. Now to the latest on that toxic train derailment in Palestine, Ohio. The governor's office has more than 4,500 cubic yards of contaminated soil have now been removed from the immediate area of the derailment. And the EPA has conducted indoor air testing in 560 homes in the area. So far, no contaminants from the derailment have been detected. ABC's Alex Perche is in Palestine for us tonight, where the disaster is now turning political. Tonight, with anxious residents in East Palestine, Ohio, desperate for help after that toxic train derailment, that newly opened health clinic fully booked, with nearly 70 appointments scheduled through Thursday. And Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg now planning to visit the community tomorrow, after he and President Biden faced fierce backlash from Republicans and former President Donald Trump. Tonight, Trump on the ground here, nearly three weeks after that fiery derailment leaked hazardous chemicals with this message. You are not forgotten. We stand with you, we pray for you, and we will stay with you in your fight to help answer and the accountability that you deserve. And with Trump in Ohio, the White House saying it's Trump himself that owes residents in East Palestine an apology. The White House saying in a statement, Congressional Republicans and former Trump administration officials owe East Palestine an apology for selling them out to rail industry lobbyists when they dismantled Obama-Biden rail safety protections, as well as EPA powers to rapidly contain spills. In 2017, Trump actually celebrated rolling back regulations that many advocates say might have protected communities. One of those withdrawn regulations calling for specialized systems on trains carrying hazardous materials. Trump tweeting, I am continuing to get rid of costly and unnecessary regulations. Much work left to do, but effect will be great. Tonight, it's not clear if any of those regulations specifically contributed to the accident in East Palestine. Our thanks to Alex. We turn now to Washington, where ABC News has learned that Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner have been subpoenaed by Justice Department Special Counsel Jack Smith in relationship to January 6th and the events leading up to that day. Meanwhile, the forewoman in the Georgia Special Grand Jury is giving insights into that investigation of attempts to overturn the 2020 election. ABC's Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl has the details. And yet another sign the federal investigation into Donald Trump's action on and before January 6th is moving aggressively. Special counsel Jack Smith has subpoenaed the former president's daughter, Ivanka, and son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Earlier this month, the special counsel issued a subpoena for Vice President Pence. Sources tell ABC News the subpoenas for Kushner and Ivanka Trump are specifically related to the special counsel's investigation of January 6th and the efforts of the former president and his allies to overturn the 2020 election. This comes as the Fulton County, Georgia district attorney considers whether to seek an indictment against Donald Trump and his allies for tampering with Georgia's 2020 election results. And now in the Georgia case, something highly unusual has happened. The forewoman of the 23-person special grand jury that investigated the case is talking publicly about the grand jury's work, revealing they recommended multiple indictments. It's not a short list. Not a short list. <laughs> she says she decided to speak because serving on the grand jury was, quote, a really cool experience. But she's giving her opinion of the case, even though most of the grand jury's work remains under seal. I will be sad if nothing happens. Like that's, that's about my only request there is, is for something to happen. I don't necessarily know what it is. I'm not the legal expert. I'm not the judge. I'm not the lawyers. The case centers on Trump's efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss in Georgia, including his infamous call asking the state's Republican Secretary of State to, quote, find exactly the number of additional votes he needed to win. I just want to find uh, 11,000 780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Those words continue to haunt him. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl for that. A flight from Jacksonville, Florida to Washington, D.C. was forced to make an emergency landing because authorities say a passenger was trying to get into the cockpit. The plane touched down in North Carolina, where law enforcement was waiting. Here's Gio Benitez. 
Tonight, an American Eagle flight traveling from Jacksonville to the nation's capital forced to land in Raleigh, Durham after an urgent message from air traffic control. A passenger allegedly trying to get into the cockpit. Subject is currently loose in the cabin, loose in the cabin, and he has tried to breach the cockpit. He's being somewhat restrained by the flight crew and other passengers. As soon as that lands, we need to get in the plane and restrain this guy. You can hear the drama unfolding. I gather the subject is not in flex cuffs, is that correct? Correct. Loose in the cabin. Our ABC station WTVD reporting crew members were able to restrain the passenger. The long gun crew is going to be on the outside and of the aircraft. They'll be standing by. Our thanks to Gio Benitez. As we continue to learn more about the after effects of COVID, we take a look at the potential long-term impacts on sleep and how to fix it. ABC's Becky Worley has those details. To try out wearable sleep trackers for a GMA segment, I took an overnight sleep study last August. <sighs> Night. Then in October, I got COVID for the first time. I had it pretty mild. Then for totally unrelated reasons, I had to retake the sleep study. I feel like Frankenstein. Along with some other lingering COVID symptoms, my sleep study showed that my average heart rate went up by 20%. And one of the key apnea readings increased two and a half times over. While sleep studies are just a snapshot of one night's sleep, my overall sleep felt worse. I had more middle of the night wake ups and then a hard time falling back asleep. Sleep issues are common. Here at the Stanford Long COVID Clinic, Director Dr. Linda Gang says sleep is one of the most common complaints of those suffering from long COVID. We're trying to figure out and unravel what has COVID done to cause these lingering symptoms. And the clinic's sleep specialist, neurologist Oliver Sumping, says it can take different forms. What are the most common sleep disruptions after COVID? From what I've seen, uh, it's very common to have insomnia for people who have long COVID and uh, sometimes the opposite of insomnia, excessive sleepiness during the day. A study published in the Journal of Sleep Medicine surveyed over 15,000 people who had post-COVID symptoms and three of the top eight complaints were sleep related. Insomnia, fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness. Thank you. Lisa Wu is experiencing all of them. I was just uh, sleeping all the time and not feeling rested. I almost got tired of sleeping. She's been dealing with post-COVID symptoms and exhaustion is one of her main complaints. But I have two little kids. I, I want to push myself. I want to be there for them. Everyone's tired with little kids, but this is just another level of uh, exhaustion. For patients like Lisa, Dr. Sumping wonders if sleep problems may be not just a symptom of long COVID, but a contributor to the brain fog, lethargy, and mood changes patients experience. The reality is that the cause and effect chain is still unknown. But some of these other symptoms can also be symptoms of poor sleep. And if we can help people with their sleep, then sometimes these other issues may improve as well. Our thanks to Becky for that. Now to the economy. With a lot of uncertainty about job cuts in the months ahead, many people who have recently lost their jobs are now turning to TikTok to share their stories and find their next gig. It's a story that we first saw in the New York Times. Rebecca Jarvis has more. People turning to TikTok, looking for new jobs, sharing money, saving tips, and even just sharing experiences after getting laid off. So last week I was laid off from my job. Um, it was kind of out of the blue and it really sucked. 25-year-old Texas native Bailey Harris was let go from her job in January. Hi, I'm Bailey. I'm 25 and I recently got laid off from my job. She turned to social media to encourage others who found themselves in the same situation. I honestly really had to just come to terms with like I'm not employed right now and I don't need to be ashamed of this fact so I'm not going to be afraid to ask for help or ask for opportunities from others. Bailey sharing how she started saving money beginning with housing. Here are the steps that I took to save money right away. I was not shameful. I let them know what happened. How can you work with me for my rent payment? The next thing to go unnecessary subscriptions and recurring expenses. I had a storage unit that really didn't have much stuff in it, so it didn't make sense to keep paying for that every month, so took everything out of there. Experts say advertising your skills on social media could be a good way to get your resume and personality to a large pool of potential employers quickly. When you go to social media, you're going straight to the source. And if somebody that is interested in the skill set that you have to offer is listening, it is the fastest way to connect and the fastest way to get hired. 
Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis. Still much more ahead tonight. Coming up, she's the most decorated winter Paralympian of all time. Oksana Masters tells us about her new memoir chronicling her life from being adopted out of Ukraine to becoming one of the most respected athletes in the world. But next, a wild rescue at sea. How two men ended up adrift in the ocean for hours clinging to a cooler. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right guys? Bring your friends. Oh wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. This is one of the most powerful projects I've ever been involved with. My son died in a shootout. I'm calling the cops on the cops. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Terrifying moments in Peru when a landslide hit a road there. Video captured by an eyewitness showed vehicles parked on the road as rocks fell blocking the highway. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Amid fears that a close poll in this weekend's elections in Nigeria may be disputed and trigger even more violence and chaos, all candidates signed a peace pledge today, promising to seek redress through the courts for any grievances. Nigerians will vote in what could be their most credible and close electoral contest since military rule ended nearly 25 years ago and the first in which a presidential candidate who is not from one of the two main parties even stands a chance a wild rescue emergency as a helicopter crew saved two brothers from the ocean after the boat they were on capsized due to a rogue wave footage from life flight australia shows a rescuer being lowered into the water near the two men who were clinging on to a floating drinks cooler the men who were in their 20s were out fishing when the incident happened and were adrift for almost four hours after their boat capsized due to a rogue wave. Our next guest is the most decorated winter Paralympian of all time. 17 medals across four different events, which is more than most Olympians. But it's her remarkable story of resilience, overcoming birth defects stemming from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which led to the amputation of both of her legs. Oksana Masters tells her story in the new book, The Hard Parts, a memoir of courage and triumph. And Oksana, I, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show, first of all, and congratulations on the book. Oh my gosh, Lindsay, thank you so, so much. <laughs> <laughs> for having me. I, I love your energy right out of the <laughs> gate. Now, you went through a, a two-year fight to adopt, uh, to get adopted from an abusive orphanage in Ukraine. Uh, you write that it became a ritual to ask the orphanage director just to get a glimpse of her picture before you even met. Tell us about your mom and the role that she's played in your life. Oh, my gosh. I mean, honestly, Lindsay, like, I would not be here speaking to you or have a story to share if it wasn't for my mom willing to fight for those through those two years and she saved my life she saved my life in so many different ways from the orphanage but then she also saved it by opening the world of sports for me and that door for me and she is she is my life She's 
And she brought you to America when you were seven years old, started your athletic journey at 17 after living with one kidney, web fingers, no thumbs, and being told what your body could not do. What was it like to ultimately discover uh, what your body could do through sports? It was absolutely amazing, and I've never felt like I've ever belonged anywhere else since when, from that moment I took my leg off and pushed away from the dock at Louisville Rowing Club and felt finally what my body was able to do, and I saw power in myself and not focusing on the things I was missing. I was starting to realize what I'm able to do with what I have despite mm. of missing legs or my hands and that's the power of, of sports at the start line. It has the ability to show that. As I said right off the top, and it's worth repeating, you are America's <laughs> most decorated winter Paralympian. Uh, you're sponsored by Nike, even modeled for Rihanna and Kim Kardashian. Uh, but you're right that, that you had a weird relationship with winning, as if you hadn't earned the win. After you worked so hard, why do you sometimes feel like you still haven't earned it? I just, um, just really struggle with being seen as an athlete, first of all, in society, as well as a Paralympic athlete, and people realizing that Paralympic athletes and the sweat equity is exactly the same, and the dedication and commitment. And I just sometimes feel that, I think the biggest moment for me, I realized I belong here at the world stage was in 2014, when I achieved my first silver medal and in the cross country events, and I finally did it without my rowing partner, Rob Jones, was absolutely incredible in London, but I always questioned, what was I able to bring to the table? Is it because he was so strong? Am I a legit athlete? And I had so many people believing I didn't belong there, I'm too small. And so to be able to finally do it on my own may help me realize that I do belong here and it doesn't matter how I look doing it or how I, the different ways to ski or ride a bike and row. What a message that applies to all of us. And you also write uh, that you want everyone who reads this book to feel 10 feet taller. Tell us what you mean by that. I, so when I looked in the mirror, I let other outside noises in society just determine how I view myself, which then started limiting what I thought I was capable of achieving and believing in myself and lack of, really, and loving myself. And I want someone and loving the hard parts, too, and seeing the strength in those moments, even though it's sometimes hard to see that sometimes you can't get over it. But when you close that book, I just want someone to feel 10 feet taller, like, okay, I'm ready, I'm empowered, I'm ready to tackle and take on that thing that I'm afraid of, or that either has happened in the past, you're working through right now, or in the future, you're afraid to take that leap and just feel empowered to just love the whole journey, the ups and the downs. Uh, you are an, a Ukrainian-American, but your Ukrainian identity has really taken precedent with Russia's aggression in your mm -hmm. home country, even gifting some of your prize money to help the efforts in your native country. Uh, what do you want people to know about Ukraine and its people? Um, you know, sometimes I'm so... When people say we didn't realize that Ukraine, like, that they're holding off and they're holding their own for so long, but I am not surprised by it because my mom always said it was my Ukrainian resilient heart that made me a fighter. And I think that's mm. what America and the world is seeing of all Ukrainian people, and that's in our DNA, and is it in my DNA? And I am so proud to remember where I come from, and always that's very important for me. And I donated to No Child Forgotten because I was a child that was forgotten with disabilities. And it was really important for me. And that's on that start line, you're able to represent something so much more than yourself. And that's being an American Ukrainian athlete racing for my home country, representing my country I live now. And it means the world to me. And the world has certainly seen the heart and the grit of Ukrainians, and we now see it in you. <laughs> Oksana Masters, you're such an inspiration. We thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Her new book, The Hard Parts, A Memoir of Courage and Triumph, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, as many look to support more black entrepreneurs this Black History Month, we show you how a toy shop is helping kids celebrate African-American culture. Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charged in a sweeping 56 count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm gonna use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison.
We're not gonna let that happen on our watch. Not with hip hop music, using our lyrics. We're gonna fight back. Rap, trap, hip hop on trial. Only on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mo Lelenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic and civil unrest across the country in 2020, at least one bright spot emerged, an increase in the number of black Americans starting new businesses. As people look to support black entrepreneurs as Black History Month, our Morgan Norwood shines a light on one of those businesses, a small toy shop aiming to help kids celebrate black American culture. Obviously, 2020 was a really heavy year for all of us. Like many Americans, Jade Magnus Oganaki spent her time during the COVID-19 lockdowns thinking about systemic racism, questioning how to make a better world for black people. I really thought about it in terms of my daughter. What was the type of world that I wanted her to experience? In 2021, Jade was inspired to start her own business, and she wasn't the only black entrepreneur to do so. By August of 2021, the number of black business owners in America increased 38% compared to pre-pandemic levels. This was originally my daughter's playroom. We had to turn it into Magnus Company headquarters. Jade launched the Magnus Company from her kitchen table in her New York City apartment, designing and selling toys that feature black children experiencing wonder and joy. When it came to finding toys or stories or even television shows about black children experiencing wonder and magic and enchantment, those things were just not there. And because I couldn't find them, I created them. She never liked saying hellos and she didn't like saying goodbyes. What does that sound like? <laughs> the company's first products, a book, Sloan in the City, and the Sloan doll based on Jade's daughter. I grew up loving Madeline, right? And there was nothing like that for little black girls. Nothing about a little black girl not trying to save the day, but just exist and live. The Sloan doll becoming a bestseller and next flying off the shelves, Orion the astronaut. I know that little black boys, like all little boys, they love astronauts, they love adventure, they love space. Our 28 days of black history cards right here. The Magnus Company also sells puzzles and a black Southern Sunday dinner playset with fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, and collard greens. Jade says she knows there will come a time to discuss the hard parts of black history, but she also wants her daughter and all little black children to celebrate the joys of black culture. Despite all of the trauma and all of the systemic barriers that we've overcome, black people have always celebrated, we've always made art, we've always fallen in love, we've always found the magic. And I want the Magnus Company to carry on that magic and to bring that magic to every child and every family who has our toys and stories. All about finding that magic. Our thanks to Morgan for bringing us that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. We'll be right back. It's like any other day. Our friends invited us to come see one.